Well, like in these works, the works that we see here, I don't think much about the concepts of history and fiction when I'm actually making an artwork. Most of the time, I'm either creating the documents that I wished already existing, or I'm imagining a situation, I'm imagining a scenario, some kind of encounter that I fear or really long for. So I'm not calculating in the studio the mix between history and fiction. I'm just making my documents. And at some point in the studio, an image or story comes together for me. If the story or image is somewhat fantastical, then I try to research moments in history when other people, whether they are living or dead doesn't matter to me, when other people have created similar stories or images. It does not matter to me whether these creations are in a book or film called fiction or a memoir or a document called history. Most of the time, I find that I'm simply repeating and in a much less subtle manner what others have already expressed. At other times, I find that I'm encountering a variation of what others have already explored. And this is the case with most of the artworks shown here. Now, in rare cases, I think that I'm encountering something quite unique. But at this point, I usually do a little more research and I find that I'm most likely wrong. What I'm experiencing is rarely unique. Strange as it sounds, I am attracted to bullets. I am attracted to bombs, to shrapnel. I find their shapes, I find their weight, their colors quite alluring. In a way, they are the most material manifestation of the wars for me. You see, I rarely saw the person actually shooting, actually bombing where I lived, but I certainly got to see. I mean, I certainly got to feel hear and experience their bullets and bombs directly. These things, this bullets, bombs, shrapnel, they are the closest link to the person on the other side. But I'm also maybe thinking that there may have been something forensic about uh, my fascination with ammunitions. Who made them? Who sold them? Who bought them? Who fired them? Who was killed, injured by them? There was clearly an economy not just in ideology or politics to all this mayhem, all these wars. And I always fantasized that one could trace the bullet back to its origin, to the person who fired it, the person who bought it, made it, invented it. These are my father's actual calendar notebooks. I found them among his papers after he passed away, and I did not know of their existence, and I was surprised at the kinds of events, the kinds of information he recorded in English and in Arabic. And most of these events were taking place when I was already in the United States. So they gave me a window onto what he, onto what my mother and sister were continuing to experience in Lebanon while I was already away. But I should also say that my father was also a very good draftsman. He could really draw very well. I loved his technical drawings. So I always imagined him drawing the bombs that were falling around the house. These drawings I actually made myself and added to the pages later. Now, I was especially struck by four events he recorded in, in his calendars. First of all, he was a builder. So naturally, he was very interested in the price and availability of building materials like concrete or steel. One tends to think that construction comes to a halt, to a stop during a wartime. It does in some places, but it also expands in others. Second, he also tracked the value of the Lebanese currency, which was massively devalued during the 1980s. You see, the Lebanese pound, the Lebanese lira, it went from three pounds to the dollar in 1983, to 50 Lebanese pounds to the dollar by 1986, and then to 2,500 Lebanese pounds to the dollar by 1992. My father's entire savings were in Lebanese pounds, so you can imagine he went from relative wealth to poverty relatively fast. Third, he also noted his father, my grandfather's death in his notebooks. My grandfather died during a particularly brutal week of fighting, and I've always wondered how they managed to bury him. And finally, sometimes the bombings were of such ferocity during certain weeks 
that he seemed to emphasize this brutality by increasing the size of his writing. And I found this quite interesting. Between 1991 and 1994, I decided to photograph neighborhoods that are very close to the Green Line. And you see the Green Line? This is the line that divided East from West Beirut. And I worked with 35 millimeter black and white film using a Leica M3, and I was not using a tripod. And I mentioned these, these photographic details not only because I'm, I'm some kind of photo geek, but it's also because these details imply certain things. You see, I learned photography at a young age, but I happened to live in a city that was in the middle of a war. When I was 12 or 13, my father would buy photography magazines for me, and I saw photographers, people like Henri Cartier-Bresson, Diane Arbus, Eugène Adjé, and others, they would make photographs in city streets. They would make pictures of buildings, of people walking in these cities. And I wanted to do this too. But this was kind of tricky in a city that was under the constant threat of military assault. Even something as simple as using a tripod was impossible. Because, of course, a tripod means you have to have time to set it up. You have to have time to adjust your composition. But how do you do this in a city that's full of snipers? You can't. These are streets and buildings that are just on the edge of East Beirut. And as you can see, many of the roads, they're narrow. They lead to another narrow street. One cannot see where the street ends. It just splits up. And most of the storefronts, they're shuttered. They're closed. It was dangerous to live in these buildings, but many people did. These neighborhoods are now completely transformed. Many of these buildings were destroyed to make room for the new downtown. The stories that are written on each plate are mostly biographical, but I attribute them to an anonymous person. You see, outsiders, outsiders are usually surprised that life goes on in a city of war. Of course, you hide. Of course, you are scared. Of course, you get depressed. You're starved. You're injured. But you also fall in love. You have fun. You learn and experience strange new things. Uh, I never actually display the physical notebooks. I always show you photographs of notebooks. So let me just say something about how I create these works, how I create the plates you are looking at. I always proceed from photographs that I find or that I make. Then I create a physical notebook, an actual notebook that includes the photographs that I found. But it also includes text that I write or text that I find as well. And lastly, I scan the book I made, the physical book. I scan it, I digitally tweak it, and then I add a caption that is part of the photographic plate you're looking at, and a caption that is part of the photographic plate I display. I don't actually display the physical notebook I make because I don't want them to come across as some sort of archeological artifact. By scanning and captioning the books, I'm also proposing that they have already been subject to some analysis by someone. These are not raw, naked discoveries. Their meaning, let's say, is not on their forehead. All archeological finds become meaningful because an entire history exists to give them meaning. And I'm intrigued by how this history functions, how and why it validates and or invalidates certain facts, certain stories. The second thing I want to say is that by creating the notebooks, the physical notebooks, I'm also indirectly creating their fictional authors, the people who made this book. So in this case, it would be the woman who I say created these pages, the woman I call Fadwa Hassoun. And most of my authors, if you notice, tend to be very serious, very professional people, a historian, an intelligence analyst, a scientist. These are people who, for some reason, decided to keep strange notes, odd drawings, something they would have a hard time including in their professional work, but that nonetheless always existed along their professional work. During the war years, 
Beirut was essentially divided. It was physically divided. East Beirut and West Beirut. And different militias controlled different parts of the city. So you can imagine movements between the various sectors was at times very, very dangerous. When the war ended in the early 1990s and the city's roadblocks were taken down, I was finally free to walk to parts of the city I had only heard about. I had never visited them before. So I walked everywhere. I took pictures everywhere, mostly in the morning, between 5 a.m. until around lunchtime. And I decided I should photograph streets, storefronts, buildings, statues. I rarely photograph people, not many people. I also knew that the city was about to be transformed again. This time, not by the bombing of building and by the war, but by the rebuilding efforts. You see, a new downtown had to be built, so thousands of buildings were destroyed. Their rubble dumped in the sea. And I wanted some record of this period, some record of this new Beirut emerging. Today, I have an archive of tens of thousands of images of the city, images that I made between 1987 and 2005. So the drawings and paintings on the back of these frames, these are copies I made of artworks that are originally created by an artist whose work I admire very much. His name is Marwan Kassab Bashi. He's a Syrian artist. He lived in Germany, he worked in Germany, but he also died recently. I think that this remarkable artist has received some attention in the Arab world, but also in Europe, and I really feel that he is deserving of more, and in a way, this is an homage to his works. But I'm still asking myself some questions about this work, like um, why did I choose to remake his images on the back of other paintings that I say are in the collection? Why not just show his original paintings and drawings, which of course I could have borrowed? Why would he or his admirers choose to hide his artworks, as I claim in my story? And what are they hiding from? And why would they choose to hide in this museum? And lastly, why are they coming out now and on this wallpapered wall as opposed to the traditional white wall of the museum? These walls that you're looking at, they include three elements that are very important to me. First, there's the laser cut shadow shape of an artwork in the middle of the wall, this cut in the middle of the wall. Second, there's the wall color itself, which is rarely, if ever, white. And third, there's this wooden floor, as well as the wall's moldings, depicted in perspective, as if it was in a photograph. You see, all these elements were together for me. They needed to be in the same object. And I will say two things about the shadows, two very different things, so just stay with me for a minute. First, the Arab world is in the middle of reconstructing the history of its modern and contemporary arts. You see, it's in the middle of trying to identify the very objects, the very figures that will enter this history. We're trying to organize them, periodize them, tell stories about them. Will this history follow the way most of the West has already organized its art history, namely along movements? You see, it's a science of isms that succeed one another so that we go from symbolism to fauvism to cubism to futurism to surrealism and so on? Or are we going to do this differently in the Arab world in a way that is quite attentive to the specificity of Arab art? Moreover, how and where we eventually display this Arab art will be very important here. You see, our walls may need to be a different color than white. We may even need different kinds of floors, lights, perspectives. But sadly, it seems that most Arab leaders have been rushing to build massive copies of mostly exhausted Western museum models, like the Louvre Abu Dhabi that opened last year, for example. Second, and this is a very different proposition, but equally important to me. You see, with these walls, I'm also proposing that some 
Arab, and I'm putting Arab between quotes here, but some Arab artworks may literally lose their shadows. The artwork does not have one, or the shadow has gone away. And I don't mean this as some kind of metaphor, and I'm not trying to be poetic. The shadow is just not present, which, as you can imagine, may be a quite frightening situation. And in this case, one may want to invent, you may want to build a device to attract the lost or miss missing shadow. You see, I regard my walls as one such device. They are shadow magnets. Now, don't ask me why the shadow is missing. I, I just don't know. So these walls, they function as, as both warning and proposals. On the one hand, they warn of the potential flattening of the history of Arab art should this history be confined to certain exhausted models. But they also offer an antidote. These are my shadow magnets. <laughs>